So I grew up surrounded by trees. The forests around my neighborhood were the place that I could go to to escape from the world and let my fantasies run wild. And I spent my days meeting friends down in the woods, hunting salamanders and swinging on ropes and running around on the trails. I was captivated by trees then, and the more I learn about them, the more they draw me in. I started my first tree service when I was 22 years old, and I spent my time divided between working as an arborist here in Beaver County and chasing hurricanes across the southern states, where I would climb trees uprooted by the storms and remove them from people's homes. This was seasonal work. And during the winters off, I used my time to travel abroad and see the sights that the world had to offer. There we go. So on one of these, one of these trips, I bought an old truck and I uh, drove it down to Guatemala and back, as you do. And, uh, <laughs> and when I was in Mexico, uh, I, I met this old timer named Juan, and Juan invited me to his eco lodge. And when we went there, he had all of this, all of this land, and, and he told me this story about when he was a young man, he had come to this land with other people, and they cleared the whole rainforest away. And he said there were jaguars and toucans and the whole rainforest thing, and they cut the whole thing down so that people could farm beef. And then for, you know, decades later, Juan moved on. He lived his life, but he never forgot what he had done there. And when he had the opportunity and the money to do so, he moved back to the area, purchased the land, started a huge nursery and made it available to all of the other people who wanted to follow in his lead of reforesting uh, in that region. And that really stuck with me. That, that made a big impact on me. And uh, so I carried that spark with me until 2014 when a series of events unfolded and swept me off into the world of reforestation. Uh, the first event was Typhoon Haiyan, as Daniel had mentioned, and at the time this was the largest typhoon in recorded history. Uh, it devastated the central Visayas region of the Philippines. I traveled to Leyte Island to join with All Hands Volunteer Organization and provide disaster relief to local communities. While I was there uh, doing the disaster relief, I met some people who went on to become my partners in a forest restoration project and became lifelong friends. This is Dudes. It's his nickname, Dudes. Dudes and I befriended each other over evening discussions about building resiliency in the face of natural disasters. I told my partners how trees could do this for communities that are trying to keep up with rapidly changing climate, like the, what's happening in the Philippines. So we agreed to be partners and start a nursery to grow the trees that we needed to accomplish our goals. So 10 years have gone by since then, and the Leyte Reforestation Project has become an accredited forestry nursery that develops tens of thousands of trees every year. And then what we do with those trees is uh, pioneer new methods of reforesting local rivers and engaging in the local community. For example, last February, we had a social media campaign called the I Love Trees Valentine's Challenge where volunteers planted a thousand trees along the local riverbanks. So here's the results of that plantation. Uh, you can see it in, in February uh, after the volunteers left. We took that photo and it looked like that and, and now it looks like this. Uh, the rate that uh, we can grow new forest in the Philippines is quite astonishing. And this planting site has grown faster than any other one that we've done. Uh, so we still have yet to figure out why that's happening and hopefully we can emulate that. So uh, in addition to these community engagements, we've become a leader in the local environmental movement with our most recent success being a partnership with Visaya State University who in July sent a group of forestry students to live and work on our farm for a month. Uh, and they learned all of our uh, techniques in reforestation, everything from making compost to growing, planting trees, maintaining planting sites, and all of the philosophy that goes behind that. When the students returned to the university after their month's stay, they all gave us two thumbs up for the program and the universities agreed to continue in sending students in further years to study with us. 
So over the decade that we've been developing the Leyte Reforestation Project, when, I, when, when I'm not there working, which is typically in the winters, I was back here at home growing a company that designs native plant installations, uh, some of which look like this. And I, I can't take uh, credit for everything that you see here. I do have a very talented uh, partner who works with me on this and with the designs and installations. And some things we have are a little bit more floral or more decorative. And then some things that we have, uh, you can almost draw parallels to what I'm developing in the Philippines. So the more I learned how to reinstate forest on Philippine riverbanks and in western Pennsylvania backyards, I realized how important it was to reinstate forests all across the world. And that's what led me to start my nonprofit, Reforest Our Future. Uh, Reforest Our Future is an organization that can help promote the passion that I have for trees and encourage other people to develop their passion for trees no matter where they're from. So one trillion, it's a big number, and that's the estimated number of trees that have been removed uh, from the face of the earth by people. That's occurred over the last, you know, 500 or 1,000 years. Um, but let's say, for example, that one trillion trees, that we woke up in the morning and one trillion trees had blown down across the world. We would declare that the largest natural disaster uh, that's ever occurred in human history. So I think the fate of mankind uh, relies on our ability to recover from this natural disaster by uh, reforesting the world around us. Forests are our most valuable resource. They provide ecological services um, that are valuable beyond the products that uh, the forests produce, such as, such as timber products. And it's these ecological services that lead to healthy ecosystems. One of their most important roles is capturing carbon. As we work on decarbonizing our economy and our lifestyles, it's important to remember that trees play an instrumental role in regulating the climate by removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in the soil and within their own structures. Trees are made up of about 50% carbon, uh, whereas people are made of carbon, but we only have about 17%. And we're like this big, and an oak tree is like this big, so you can imagine how much carbon you could fit in, a, in, a, in an entire forest. So um, this creates a balance. This, this storage of carbon that trees do creates a balance in the, in the atmosphere where temperature and rainfall is maintained across the earth in a, in a sweet spot that, that people can exist in, not too hot and not too cold. So mature trees do this the best uh, by capturing around 50 pounds of carbon dioxide annually but we need a lot of them to offset our production. The average person worldwide uh, produces around four tons of carbon, which would mean they would have to plant around 160 trees a year to offset their carbon. Now, Americans, uh, we like to do everything bigger and better and not to be outdone. Uh, we produce four times the amount of carbon that's produced annually. So that means we would have to plant 640 trees a year, each one of us. And that's fine, and I would uh, totally advocate for that. Uh, but there's other ways that we could reduce our carbon output as well. So one thing we could do is buy only what we need. And, and it's important to keep in mind uh, the, the language of the word need. We throw that around, it's very casual, and, and, and I feel like a, a little bit entitled. And we, we say, oh, I'm going to the store, I need this, and I need this, and I need that. And what that does is that leads us into like consumerism, which leads to uh, producing goods, which leads to more carbon dioxide, and so on and so forth. So when you think about the things uh, that you need, maybe it's better to think uh, in terms to say, I would like to have it, and, and, then, do I, and then do I really need it? Uh, for things that you would you know, just like to have, for non-essential things, uh, you could buy them secondhand, um, obviously, reduce the use of plastics, that's no-brainer there. Lower your thermostat in the winter. Plant more trees that provide shade to lower your cooling cost in the summer. Uh, it is going to get hotter and hotter. Make the change to more efficient technologies uh, as they become available. And watch what we eat. Um, agriculture is one of the main drivers of deforestation. Uh, we don't have time to get into uh, all of that tonight. Um, but you can start looking into that yourself. 
And then beyond that, uh, all those things contribute time, money, and effort to restoring forests. Uh, if we can afford to buy a latte, we can afford to plant trees. Restoring forests used to be a term reserved for Save the Rainforest campaigns of the 80s. Now forest restoration is taking place from the Amazon to our backyards. No matter where they're located, forests are important for the creatures who live in them. That includes us. Preserving trees and restoring the forests around us is the number one thing that we can do to restore the natural balance to the world. So when I started in the tree care industry, which is actually a misnomer because it's hard to find uh, a lot of people in the tree care industry that actually care about trees, uh, the urban forest of Beaver County was a lot more full than it is today. Through a campaign of misinformation by major industries that profit from their removal, this vital resource has been extracted from our communities over the years. Uh, so this is from the, an advertisement from the tree care industry. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of these uh, it's very like, standard model and advertising tree companies are using now. Uh, they also use a lot of fear tactics in advertisement with pictures of trees on houses, with uh, wording that says things like, is your family safe? So they're uh, promoting fear, which promotes a lot of cutting of trees. Uh, the power equipment industry is a huge contributor to deforestation. The still, who makes uh, still chainsaws and leaf blowers and all that stuff, they made $6 billion last year on equipment that is primarily designed to remove trees. So how does still uh, indoctrinate their customers and, and build up such a following within their brand? Well, they start them young. Uh, and that's a little bit cut off. Just let me read that. Uh, this, this, this toy will make kids want to get outside and pretend like they are cutting trees. Uh, I'm not sure that that's the direction that we really want to be going uh, right now, but that's the direction that still wants to go, and they have the money to go there, so that's the messaging that they're putting out. Uh, the media is uh, a big proponent of fear in our community of trees. Every time one tree blows over, it makes the headlines, it's big news, and then, and then I have uh, people telling me that they lay in bed at night, at night just thinking about their trees and worrying about their trees that they're going to fall through the roof and kill them. I hear that so many times. I think that the media contributes to that. And then people cave into their fear. And after, and after a while of thinking about that tree, they just have it removed so that they can sleep better at night. Um, then we've got, uh, this, this just happened the other day. This was a tract of land that had a small cleared property, but then a large patch of forest behind it in Cranberry. And you know, I think everybody understands what goes on in Cranberry. So when I drove by this forest the other day, uh, there was no forest left, but there, there were these bulldozers. So the, uh, building, the building industry contributes a lot to that. And the building industry wants to sell you uh, this concept. Uh, this is what the, the new dream home uh, looks like. Uh, as you can see, there are no trees there. In the lawn care industry, it's a massive industry. Uh, we have two million acres of turf grass being maintained in Pennsylvania now. Uh, I'm not sure what the statistic is across America, but it's really astronomical and, and, and growing. Um, this uh, True Green put out last year 100 million pamphlets in North America to promote the concept of growing and maintaining more turf grass. So you can see that uh, their advertisement says that they have a truck full of solutions. So what does uh, True Green's truck full of solutions look like for residents of Beaver County? Well, it looks like this. And, and it looks like this. We have schools. Uh, we have uh, our hospital there, fairly treeless landscapes. Uh, a lot of churches, for some reason it's weird, a lot of churches uh, have very few trees. Uh, I've watched this church over the last few years systematically remove all of the large trees uh, from its property. And another shot of the hospital there, and then that's a school in Brighton Township. And uh, so, you know, that's, uh, so True Green is uh, 
you know, they're, they're, they're getting their way. They're coming out ahead. We have more houses, one in New Brighton, and we have one over here in Beaver. And you can see a lot of this uh, going on in Beaver County. The neighborhoods we live in are decreasing in the value of their canopy year after year. Uh, here's some statistics from the Department of Agriculture's LIDAR data shows. Uh, you've got raccoon, 61%. Obviously, they're out in the woods there. Chippewa, and Chippewa is about the state average of 52% canopy coverage. Uh, Patterson is what's considered the ideal level for an urban area of 40%, but then uh, it rapidly drops down as we get into some more industrial towns, such as Midland, Aliquippa, and Beaver Falls. And, and, and then it really starts to fall, where you see these statistics. And they, these were taken from 2011, uh, and I would guess that they are down a couple of percent from then. So you may look at a community like Ambridge, and Ambridge may only now show 13% uh, coverage in its canopy. And some of that may be taken from small patches of forest. So in, in the actual neighborhoods, there may only be four or five uh, percent canopy. And it's very common that you can see uh, entire streets that were tree lined years ago that now uh, currently have no trees at all. So there are efforts to plant new trees in Beaver County, but these efforts are generally misguided and don't take into consideration that trees are living organisms and have specific needs. Our lack of understanding of trees leads us to mismanage this resource that uh, we rely on for so many things. Here's some typical, typical way people are planting trees right now. Um, and if you look out in the woods, which is a tree's natural habitat, you can't, you can't see any of this going on. Uh, you, see, you see leaves and a forest floor and other plants around. And uh, somehow along the way, we've gotten the idea to uh, plant these trees in these circles and tie them down with ropes and put no mulch on them or put too, mulch, too much mulch or put Band-Aids on them. I don't know what that's all about. And then what this misplanting leads to are young trees that we want to grow but uh, actually begin to decline. And a big reason because the uh, we tend to favor our lawns over the trees, so we're trying to mow or weed whip every last blade of grass that we can. And then so it ends up in damaging the stems of the young trees that have been planted. I got one more shot of that. And uh, these, are, these are severe injuries for young, for young plants. These trees are only a couple of inches in diameter, so these are massive wounds that they're trying to heal from. And, uh, and most likely these trees will not make it. But if we can start doing trees right, if we can start getting trees planted right, there are ways that they can improve Beaver County. They can capture pollutants. Um, we have some large polluting entities uh, that are making airborne particulates that trees can capture for us and help to mitigate. Trees create security. They actually reduce crime. Uh, there's a stereotype that if there's a lot of trees, people can hide and jump out and get you. But uh, the, the, the truth and the science behind it is that more, more trees um, equal lower crime rates as much as uh, 10 or 12%. So imagine if Beaver County had 10% less crime, what a tremendous impact that would be. Trees reduce stress. They produce chemicals that, we're, that we breathe in and that is, uh, has calming effects on us. So more trees equals less stress. They can increase your property value, reduce heat. Um, and once again, we've had the hottest, uh, I think every year in the last 10 years or something, has been the hottest on record. Uh, 2023 was the uh, record for heat-related deaths in the United States. So the more trees we plant, uh, the cooler we can, cool, we can make the planet. And then trees are just beautiful for our schools, churches, homes, and streets. And importantly, they increase our connection to the natural world. Um, and this is really important because we are nature. We are a living, breathing part of nature. We're not separate from nature. We're not above it. And when we curate the return of these natural elements, it serves as a reward mechanism for ourselves and for the life that's around us. For example, if you plant one milkweed, you can be rewarded when you see a monarch butterfly come to your one milkweed. And, and, and every day the monarch may come and you may have a reward that day. Well, imagine if you planted an entire meadow, uh, those natural rewards could be amplified exponentially. 
And beyond that, just imagine if you planted a dynamic new forest. So what's holding us back from giving ourselves these rewards? Uh, mostly, I think it's the belief in the rhetoric that's created by those industries that profit when we suppress or eliminate nature. Look, restoring nature is easy because nature has a, a natural, strongly developed function to regenerate in areas where it's been lost. Uh, if you've ever seen in the springtime where you have a million little trees popping up in your lawn, that's a clear sign from nature that, 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 that it's trying to regenerate, that it's been lost and it wants to rush back in and recolonize that area. So it's up to us to open our minds and open our hearts to begin allowing regeneration to occur rather than continuing to suppress it. It benefits us to stop buying into the concept that conquering nature is something to be proud of and begin welcoming it back in like the old friend that it truly is. Reforest Our Future is here to reshape the way we live by creating a new narrative around trees and the natural world. It's our vision that by doing this, it will allow people to begin discovering a part of themselves that has been missing. And by inviting new forests into our life, we will be inviting the part of the human spirit that lives within them. Thank you. And speaking of invitations, Reforest Our Future is having its first gala fundraising event coming up on uh, December 9th. Uh, Saturday. It's just right around the corner. So I have some invitations for you all. I hope you can make it. I'll just pass these out. And then what we're going to do, yeah, would you like to pass them out? Great, thanks. And, and, and then what I'm going to ask you to do now is, is break into some groups. And we would like to see you break into groups of three. And quite possibly, if you could do that with uh, maybe not the people that you came with, but maybe meet some new people. And we want to have a sharing um, activity where you can discuss some good times that you have memories about trees. So I find that typically childhood memories of trees uh, stick with people. If you, have, if you have memories of specific trees in your childhood, feel free to share that with your group of three. So if you would all like to scoot around and introduce yourselves to some people and share those memories. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and thank you all for spending your evening here with us tonight to talk about trees. Um, so I'm one of four full-time biology faculty here at Penn State Beaver. Um, biology is one of 11 degrees that you can do start to finish um, here on this campus. Um, so I'm excited to tell you about some of the research that I do um, on campus and also across the state of Pennsylvania. My research centers around disturbances that affect forests and how forest plants um, and the soil environment responds to these disturbances. Um, and I mostly work on disturbances that are human caused. Um, so my research informs a lot of basic biology understanding, but also is really useful help for helping us to know how we can manage our forest to be healthy and productive and diverse, and also how we can conserve um, rare species on the landscape. So just to kind of set the stage, um, give you a little bit of background on some of the disturbances that have occurred to Pennsylvania forests, and Jeff alluded to some of these. Um, I want you to imagine back, um, we're in the 1600s, the first European settlers are coming to Pennsylvania. Um, at that time, Pennsylvania was more than 90% forested. So the forest was quickly cut over for farming, for homesteads, food, heat, charcoal furnaces, the railroads were put in, and before the year 1900, um, we had lost 70% of our forests. So in just a, a couple centuries, um, we saw a dramatic change in our landscape. After the cutover, um, when much of Pennsylvania looked like this, a lot of the remaining slash that was on the ground caught fire. So we had many really intense, big fires. And this scared people. And this led us 
to extreme fire suppression. Okay? And so neither of these is really what we would have seen historically in Pennsylvania. Not the big intense fires and not no fires. So generally we would have seen regular low intensity fires in a lot of the drier portions of our state. The European settlers, um, as they moved in, also did a lot of hunting, so both for the market and for subsistence. So by 1900, we actually had almost no deer in the state, which I think I saw one when I was pulling in this morning for work. <laughs> Unfortunately, it met its demise on the road. So it's hard to imagine no deer. Um, but we were at the point where we actually were restocking deer from other states. Um, we had really strict hunting regulations in Pennsylvania in the early 1900s. Um, so these two things, um, along with the fact that we had really great forage for deer, because we had cut all of the forest down, burned a lot of those areas, and they were growing back like crazy. Okay, so we had great food for the deer. Um, and we had gotten rid of their main predators, the mountain lion and the wolves. So these conditions set the stage for deer populations to rebound really quickly. Um, so by 1915, there are already documented um, crop failures because of deer. And in the 1920s, we had our first records of forest regeneration problems because of deer, which is pretty amazing, right? Just a couple decades after, after we were restocking. So as you drive around this week, you, know, you can kind of be thinking back to, oh, what did it look like in the, night, or in the 1600s, 90% forest, and kind of compare that to what it looks like now, right? So we have dramatically fragmented our landscape. Um, lots of agriculture, roadways, um, commercial and housing developments. This is a major shift. And this is a big deal when we're thinking about our forest species, because they're no longer able to move around the landscape. With fossil fuel burning, we've seen a lot of different kinds of pollution occurring. Um, and one of the big ones is acid deposition, which we don't hear a lot about anymore. Um, because with the Clean Air Act, we've actually done a really good job at reducing our air pollution from fossil fuels in terms of sulfur dioxide. Um, but we still have um, the impacts of this in our soils. So a lot of our soils are a lot more acidic today than they would have been a century ago. Jeff talked a bit about climate change, so this is another issue related to fossil fuel burning, and it impacts the composition of our forests. So in many places, warmer temperatures or changing precipitation regimes or different levels of storm events are going to affect what kind of trees and other plants and animals um, can survive here. Um, so for example, our state tree, the hemlock, um, is predicted to decline um, in our region because of climate change. Global trade has brought a lot of invasive species into our area. So these are non-native species uh, that are very aggressive and that can push out native species. And so one of the big problems um, in terms of plants is the tree of heaven. We have tons of those on our campus. Um, and there are a lot of other invasive species too. You can think about chestnut blight um, or the spotted lantern flies are some examples. So all of these stressors and a lot more um, add up to affect our landscapes and our forests that remain. So I'm studying several of these different disturbances, sometimes in combination, and I'm gonna tell you about um, several of my research projects that are occurring here in Pennsylvania. In collaboration with another faculty member from Penn State Beaver, Dr. Sarah Nelson, as well as a professor from University Park, Eric Burkhart, I'm studying ramps. Um, ramps are also known as wild leeks. They are an edible member of the onion family and are widely collected. Um, has anybody eaten ramps? Has anybody collected ramps? Yeah, so we have them around here. Um, 
what we're studying is how different abundances of deer um, and how different abundances of exotic earthworms affect ramps, specifically the genetic diversity of ramps. Um, so you might not know that a lot of our earthworms are actually not from here. Like if you think about the night crawlers, they are not native to Pennsylvania. And they can do a lot of uh, change to our soil system. So they incorporate that leaf litter of the forest down into the soil. Um, and that reduces the capability of a lot of our seeds to germinate. Um, so that can be a big deal. So I'm looking at how um, those worms, as well as deer, which don't like this plant, but they eat the competitors, um, how those two factors can affect ramps. So we expect that this research should help to inform ramp conservation and ramp, ramp harvesting practices. Um, in collaboration with Margarita Lopez Uribe, who is up at University Park and also with Extension. Um, she's an entomologist. Um, we are working on this really pretty uh, legume or bean plant called blue lupin. Um, so blue lupin grows in forest edges and open savanna areas. It's a lot more common as you get out into the Midwest in the prairie region. Um, it's actually listed as uh, Pennsylvania rare. So here we have less than 30 populations in the state of this plant. Um, and the number of populations, as well as the individuals in those populations, are dwindling. Um, and most of these populations we have here now just um, are on the right of ways. So we no longer really have too many in a natural habitat. Um, so what we're looking at is the genetic diversity of lupin across its range. It ranges from Canada um, down to Texas and out to the Midwest. Um, so we're trying to look at how population size um, related to fragmentation affects blue lupin. Um, and we're also doing an experiment. It's loud, sorry, it's very short. So we're doing an experiment where we're looking at how prescribed fire, um, in addition to deer exclusion fencing, um, affects blue lupin and its insect pollinators, mostly bees, um, and the other plants that live in this kind of environment. So we're hoping that we'll be able to give better information for folks who want to restore blue lupin on where they should source their seeds from as a result of our genetics project, and also to know more about how we can use techniques like fire and fencing to conserve this plant. With Dwayne Diefenbach, Patrick Drohan, and Mark McDill up at University Park, um, we have this really big uh, project where we're looking at how deer competing native vegetation like the mountain laurel in this photo um, and acid deposition affect the forest community. So in central Pennsylvania, in the Bald Eagle, Rothrock, and Susquehannock state forests, we have over 200 plots where we're looking at natural variation in the soils and the vegetation, as well as different levels of hunting to see what's going on with the forest community. And then we also have an experiment where we're adding lime to change the soil pH. We have fences up to exclude deer from certain areas, and we've used herbicide and mowing to control some of this competing vegetation. Um, so our results should help us learn how to better regenerate diverse forests in Pennsylvania, given these kinds of stressors. This experiment's on campus. Um, so if you had arrived just a few weeks earlier, you, as you're driving around University Drive, you might have seen some of my shade cloths that are out there in the woods. Um, so we have four different blocks of experiments. Um, so this is related to some of my past work where I found that deer, um, by eating woody vegetation, um, can actually affect the environment for the little wildflowers. So for example, by eating saplings, um, they create more light for wildflowers, and they can also change how many soil nutrients and how much water is available for those wildflowers. Um, so this experiment is designed to tease apart above ground and below ground competitive effects of woody plants on wildflowers. 
One of the target wildflowers that I study is trillium. Um, this is in part because deer love trillium and deer are blamed with eating a lot of the trillium and sort of reducing our ability to find them. And also because trillium are a really popular wildflower for people to see in the spring. Um, so I'm hoping that this experiment will sort of help us understand generally plant distributions, but also to um, be able to improve populations of these popular wildflowers. So this year, the spotted um, lanternfly was in full force on campus. Um, did other people have it in their homes or work? Yeah. So spotted lanternflies, if you don't know them, um, they were first detected in Beaver County in 2020. It's not very long ago. Um, and they feed on a wide variety of woody plants, but their favorite is another invasive, the tree of heaven. So I mentioned before we have a lot of tree of heaven here on campus, and we were noticing a lot of damage to the tree of heaven, a lot of feeding by these insects. Um, so with my fabulous student research assistant, Mallory Nickel, um, we set up a monitoring program um, where we are trying to investigate whether or not the spotted lanternfly are actually causing some long-term damage to the tree of heaven, if they're actually managing to slow its growth or might they kill them with time, um, so that we can better prioritize how to control invasive species. And there's Mallory. You have to wear the hood because the insects excrement is very disgusting and rains down from the trees. She earned her, <laughs> her money. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you would like to learn more about my research, um, there are three different websites there that you can visit. Um, and you can also feel free to email me with questions. But right now I want to move us back into our small group discussion, so don't go anywhere yet. Um, but thank you very much for your attention. I love this quote, um, Gifford Pinchot, he's responsible for a lot of our state parks here in Pennsylvania. Um, the vast possibilities of our great future will become realities only if we make ourselves, in a sense, responsible for that future. So when you return to your small groups of three, um, I'm asking that you each try to think of how could you um, increase or improve Beaver County Forest. Um, so Jeff and I have come up with some possible suggestions for you. They're on some handouts that will get to you. Um, so I'm going to suggest that you sort of look at this list and think about which of these are most exciting to you, which seem most feasible. Um, are there roadblocks to getting them done? And are there possible solutions you might see? Um, and I left some blanks there so that maybe you come up with some of your own really wonderful ideas and write them down. Um, so we have until about 7.15 um, for you to talk in your small groups. And Jeff and I will sort of mill around in case there's anything you want to talk to us about. Um, but we'll then ask you to come back and report out on some of your ideas. Okay? Thank you, everybody.